それで初めてから言いますよ。ななんかネット情報相当ディレイあるよ。ないんじゃないですか。ね、<笑>ネットから質問とか。もないこれ画面に映んなくないなんか。顔が綺麗じゃん。ちょっと一番ここに立てばいい。ちょっと上向きにした方がいい。ちょっとなんかカメラが。ちょっとディレイがあるから。Uh, okay, so、uh, let's get started.、Uh, so today、uh, we have、uh, Keisuke Suzuki from the University of Sussex.、Uh, he's my former colleague at Sussex. And so today he's going to talk about studying atypical visual consciousness with virtual reality. Thank you, Ryota.、Uh, I'm Keisuke, and normally I'm studying in Sussex in UK. And today, just,、uh, I just came、uh, in Tokyo after the conference in China, Beijing. And thank you for、uh, giving the opportunity to give a talk here. So today, I'm talking about、uh, using virtual reality to study consciousness, especially、uh, at a typical kind of abnormal experience. And especially、uh, focus on visual consciousness. And I just started starting off the, my talk with the, how to study consciousness. And th there's, of course, many different a p p r o a c h to study consciousness. And I think the most basic、uh, concept to study consciousness is, is the level of consciousness. So people like studying awake state from coma or awake state from dream or those. 
totally different level of consciousness. And also people study more con contents oriented approach to the consciousness, what, what they actually see in certain circumstances. And there's another li little bit different approach to consciousness is more like self related, self oriented stuff, like uh, the self as a, like uh, you in your memory or you as the, I'll say, uh, personal level of self. And also there is more fundamental level of your self, like a bodily self or act acting self. And basically I'm really uh, or, or interested in this really low level self, like a embodied self. And for the bodily experience, there's uh, so many interesting phenomena uh, about bodily consciousness. Like, uh, I think some people here have this experience. It's the, the one, I don't know, is a symptom or not, but it's the one syndrome called Alice in Wonderland. So people sometimes feel your body is kind of di different distance or different size. And especially uh, the children in a fever have this kind of experience. And also the out of body experience, people watch yourself from the external point of view. And this is actually not so, uh, I think I heard like 1% uh, of population actually naturally have this experience. And the most kind of uh, extreme one is called he autoscopy that people experience double body. So you actually see, you experience you in two or multiple different location, which is kind of bizarre. And we also have some experimental manipulation to study this kind of bodily uh, disturbance. Like this is famous uh, illusion called rubber hand illusion. Just people stroke your hand and a <laughs> fake hand and people start feeling your body is sifted towards the fake hand and you kind of losing your body ownership on your actual physical hand. And this is just a part of your body, but there's another study actually using virtual reality to induce full body illusion of this version about 100 illusion so this time people are just watching yourself with a head mounted display and someone stroke your back with the stick and you're actually watching the, this stick actually uh, touching your body but you 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 see yourself uh, one meter behind you and people actually start feeling you are not here you, your body is actually being there and this is also, uh, this is just a virtual reality, the experimental indu induction of the body experiment, experience, but also brain stimulation. There's certain certain area of the brain when it's stimulated, people actually experience out of body experience. So we, this out of body experience is not a chaotic phenomenon, but actually happening in your brain, kind of type of illusion of your body. And Along this, science, uh, along this line of study, uh, we actually study rubber hand illusion, but a little bit different version. And we basically focus on uh, the signal from your body within, not the external signal. So this time uh, we use heartbeat signal to flash your fake hand uh, out sync and in sync of your heartbeat signal. And we found when you watch your hand is flashing according to your heartbeat, uh, people feel stronger ownership. So you actually start feeling this fake, fake hand as your own. But it doesn't didn't happen for the asynchronous condition. So maybe the same as rubber hand illusion or out of body illusion, uh, which basically uh, our feeling of volume may be coming from the integration of the March sensory uh, visual tactile information, but maybe heartbeat, some signal from inside your body also contribute to feel your body. So, uh, so virtual reality is so the study showing we use to simulate kind of a typical bodily experience or conscious experience. But previous study have more focus on uh, body oriented self consciousness, but not so many study uh, to simulate the visual aspect of consciousness. So this is the end of the introduction. I, I'm in this talk. I'm going to talk about two different study I 
work in on lens injury. First one is again the both study I'm using virtual reality. Well, this one is uh, first one is a sensory motor coupling and visual awareness. And another one, the second half of my talk is about this bit trippy uh, <laughs> hallucination hallucinatory uh, simulator using virtual reality and a deep deep neural network. Okay. So first study is it's just put the title simply sensory motor coupling modulate visual awareness of 3D object. That's it's a bit uh, redundant, but I again talk about bodily self consciousness. So the people study uh, consciousness in terms of body, but there is mainly two different stream of study. So first one is ownership oriented approach. So basically, as I described in the earlier, the, there is a so there are bodily related illusion, like rubber hand illusion or full body illusion. And people uh, study this kind of uh, illusion of body experience and discuss the feeling of body is, is maybe fundamental aspect of self-consciousness. It's still really controversial. Some people, of course, deny maybe body is just a content of consciousness, not a fundamental, you know, uh, foundation of consciousness, but some people actually like uh, when we have a conscious experience, always we see the world from this first personal perspective and always having body here and that kind of uh, body bodily signal may be the foundation of uh, consciousness. But all these approaches just are more like a I'll say static sense of body. You just feel the body as uh, static, not the static, but a kind of you own some uh, someone's body. But there's another approach is more action oriented. So uh, one of such approach using uh, more focus on body is the feeding of agency. So when you make an action or move your body, normally we feel uh, not just a body ownership, but also you actually feel uh, you are initiating your own action. So which is sometimes referred to the feeding of agency. And also there is a, it's a bit similar but different approach called sensory motor approach to consciousness. And this is a little bit more, I would say, drastic view to the consciousness. Some, sometimes pe people say they can study subjective sense of self with focusing on action. And sometimes they say like uh, there's no mind-body problem. It's more like a body-body problem. It's like, like uh, there's a two different type of body body as subject and body as object. And action-oriented approach maybe try to kind of bridge a gap between these two different type of body, conceptually different type of body. And I'm more focused on the, this second part of approach to, to the bodily experience. And I just briefly summarize the sensory motor approach. And sensory motor theory has actually long history from uh, uh, Gibsonian uh, affordance. So this is a cookie cutter that Gibson himself actually used. So the Gibson is famous for affordance, but he is really focused on the sensory motor theory of perception, especially he advocates the active touch. So touch is really good example. Touch is not really passive. You need to, when you touch something, you also need to actually explore something. So he actually used this cookie cutter to uh, differentiate passive and active conditions. So when you uh, this experiment is quite simple. When you, you the task is you have to identify which shape of the cutter you are actually touching. But when you uh, possibly someone just push this cutter cookie cutter on your hand, you don't really identify which cutter you are touching. But once you start exploring this object, of course, more than ninety percent people can identify what object you what object you are actually touching. And this is uh, the other uh, affordance theory and the Gibson's idea is more like touch oriented. But the more recently <coughs> Kevin O'Regan and Albert Noe uh, propose active perception, which is or active vision. And they basically said vision is maybe also something like a touch. So vision normal people I think normal 
normal concept, I'll say normal concept of vision is more like passive. You just, your brain just pers passively perceives the information from external side, external world. But their claim is vision also really active process. You need to basically explore the world using uh, eye movement and everything. And he, they actually said much stronger claim that experience something should be considered as a something that happened, not, not something happened to us, but some kind of acti activity or potential activity that we are engaging. So they, they change the view to the perception more like active uh, behavior. And there's some empirical evidence, for example, uh, the people who born as a bride and after several years, they kind of recover from their sight. They didn't really see anything for a while. So that's maybe one reason. They, they didn't have any sensory motor experience before. So vision itself, even your eyes intact, you didn't see anything before acquiring some kind of sensory motor contingency. And there's a little bit similar, but there is uh, another interesting uh, evidence that from really, again, really uh, 70s study. This guy is actually Brian, but he put the, some device which basically substitute the vision to tactile. So he actually has a camera and camera is co connected to uh, his very in the skin with, it's not so, I'll say high resolution, like a 10 by 10 stimulator. It basically is to convert the vision, visual information to a tactile stimulation. And interestingly, when he just put the camera somewhere, he didn't see anything. But once he start moving the camera by his own movement, he suddenly starts seeing the spatial perception, not just the, so before that he just feels come tickling sensation his skin. But once he ex actively explores the world with the camera, he finally sees the world as a almost same as normal vision. And this sensory motor approach maybe have some advantage compared to the other approach. For example, they claim that the sensory motor theory can explain certain aspects of visual consciousness. And one of that is the uh, perceptual presence, which basically uh, means how realistic the object is. So normally we have a strong feeling of reality or presence of uh, object in front of you. But when you imagine like uh, this tomato in your brain, you don't really feel this is real. So there's some, even to the same kind of uh, category, there are some objects physically existing in the world have some kind of stronger feeling of presence. And this presence is interesting in consciousness science because this looks like a structural property of our consciousness. Not because it's not uh, depending on conscious contents. It's not uh, so like this glass looks real, and we can also uh, imagine like a drawing, really less realistic glass of with the water, but. Of course, there's a visually some difference, but normal there we ha we can maybe separate the feeling of presence of the as a property of something in the real world, but it's not uh, depending on actual contents of the uh, consciousness. And in psychiatric condition, there is uh, some disease called depersonalization, who which people actually feel attenuated feeling of presence all the time. So they basically feel always they are in a kind of dream or some, some something like really, how to say, uh, dream-like experience all the time. And also in the people in depression feel everything kind of flutter and uh, grayness and uh, that also described as a little bit different, uh, how to say, magnitude of feeling presence. And there's another example for uh, from the synesthesia. The synesthesia is the people who can see a color uh, in a black letter or number. So some people that also, I think 2% of the population have this kind of, have, uh, I don't know, ability or kind of characteristic, but people see uh, 
colorful image and uh, associated with each individual uh, character or letter. And interestingly, when they see this color, they can actually distinguish this synesthesia induced color from the actual physical color. And they basically say the synesthesia color is not realistic as normal color. And it's kind of interesting because it, it looks both color, it's also both, it's actually a color, but uh, there's some difference in, the, in terms of present. And this is not actual glass, by the way. It's a draw, drawing glass. So it's, again, this is not the contents of, it's not the contents of the, the object, but it's something more than, some, uh, more than the contents of the, the world. And recently, uh, Anu says, actually my boss, uh, published a paper to, how say, operationalize this theory of uh, perceptual presence in terms of the sensory, in, in sensory motor coupling with uh, active inference and free energy principle. I, I, I'm not going to talk about detail about free energy stuff, but basically he described percep perceptual presence is counterfactual prediction from the generative model of your brain about the sensory consequence of action. So it's, I think it's kind of rephrasing the sensory motor contingency in terms of a free energy principle or predictive coding framework. So basically, maybe same stuff, but you, uh, you can imagine like a, a tomato would look like this or that way if I would rotate it. So it's kind of, it doesn't happen, but it's, as we kind of, prediction always happening in your brain and that might be associated with the present. And maybe this is not so important, but uh, in this way, for example, synesthetic color is not so realistic. It's just because the, these people never actually experience sensory motor coupling with this, this induced color, because it's always, you can, the, the red in a tomato, you can actually, always this red is coming with the actual object. But a synesthetic color always just appears on the number, or sometimes it's uh, in your brain, but they never actually have any sensory motor experience with this color. So that's why, on your experience, there is no sense of presence or, or for this object. And uh, so there is some interesting stuff in the sensory motor theory and the perceptual presence and sense of reality. So I just made. Uh, the system to explore this question. I just made an augmented reality setup to interact with the object with a different sensory motor coupling. So, uh, what is that? Highly immersed. So basically, we can interact with the object with really highly immersed condition with the head mounted display. And because the object is uh, all virtual, I can manipulate the how, how people can interact with the object in many different arbitrary way. Uh, and normal object like a cup, we already master the sensory motor coupling. So I just designed new new shape of the object. It's a bit weird shape, but uh, so that that so that people never actually have a, a sensory motor experience before. But you can maybe imagine the, how to interact. But yeah, anyway, and. This is the object I just projected on this augmented reality marker. So uh, with the head mount display, even to me, it's really realistic. I cannot say this is not exist in the real world. But, and of course, this is the normal one, but like this one, I, I just stopped the coupling. So. Whatever you move the object, I mean, the board, the object on, on located on the board never rotates like a, like the moon. Or as a version is just uh, inverting the axis. So when you move like this, an object will look completely opposite direction. And using this method, this setup, <clears throat> Uh, we actually try to capture the feeling of presence or perceptual presence with this object. And for the moment, we just compare the normal coupling and an inverted one. And we actually use different 
have an increased measure of presence, but didn't really work. Only one exception is a directory asking people how how object is realistic, how, how it looks realistic in two different conditions. And it's not surprising really, but when you can interact with the object with normal way, people rate higher presence or higher reality with this object. So we still kind of, uh, exploring what kind of paradigm is the good for capture this feeling. Uh, it's actually there, so I really strongly feel when the object is disturbed since remote coupling, it's really strange feeling. So I'm exploring some other way. And there's some interesting study recently for using binocular suppression. So basically this idea is when, you sh when you're shown really high contrast mass, uh, contrast pattern in one eye, and another eye, when you see some target object, it suppresses the visibility. So the high contrast mask suppresses the visibility of the target object for a second or sometimes longer. So people use this this method to study conscious and subconscious visual processing. And one study or, or one or two studies shows, for example, when you see your hand in this way, you no, know, when you make your hand like this way. And you see a hand this way or this way. So it's basically controlling congruency between your physical vestibular hand position and showing your hand. And they found when the hand, the physical hand, the visual hand is congruent, it, it breaks through the suppression earlier than in congruent case. So vestibular, visual vestibular information actually influences the, the formation of visibility of the target object. And uh, similar things, but this, the right one is the pa participant actually physically rotate counterclockwise or clockwise using mechanical chair. And they're shown the arrow left or right. And again, congruent case, if the arrow is congruent with your movement, that arrow breaks through the suppression uh, the much uh, faster compared to the incongruent case. And these are more body ownership for kind of the vestibular information and visual information might be interacting. Uh, there's another study that when you're blindfolded and you're asked to move your hand in front of you, and some people see some sort of motion with direction. So you, even you don't really use any visual process, you experience something associated with your motion, your action. And it's not relevant, but interestingly, in for synesthesia people, synesthesia people, the synesthesia for graphing color, the people see a color for the text or number, they see a lot of something with this condition. So maybe their association is not just for the text and the color, but it's basically their much modal association is much stronger than other people. So uh, for this study, I'm using binocular suppression. So as I already said, but just briefly said, the binocular suppression is basically this kind of high contrast mask suppress the, another, the contents of another eye. And it's useful method for studying mechanism of conscious or unconscious, subconscious processing. So the, the idea is simple. I just use this weird sensory motor coupling object with binocular suppression in virtual reality. So I'm using this mask. It's a bit different from a con continuous plus suppression originally uh, designed by Tuchia. It's called moving Mondrian mask. So basically all the rectangle is moving continuously all the time. And I just found this is the mask, the 3D object better <laughs> than the classic one. But yeah, I didn't actually systematically explore this mask, but it's just uh, something I just found. And so far, we did two different experiments using binocular suppression. So first study, uh, we just made uh, uh, three hogs to make people can make a continuous movement, left or right, counterclockwise or clockwise. And this is actually experimental scene. And we control the sensory motor coupling in two different ways. Uh, first one is uh, congruence. So when you move, 
So every single trial, people are asked to rotate a table or call left or right, clockwise or counterclockwise. But they see the object uh, start appearing behind the mask is rotating the same way or different way. So it's a congruent condition. And uh, there's another condition that uh, in addition to congruence, uh, sometimes object is rivally coupled with your movement. But in some condition, the object movement is just replayed from a previous session. So it's not, uh, how to say, directly coupled in, in time, even it's congruent or incongruent. So it's two different, congruency and contingency is two different parameters. And the task is basically uh, people have to answer left or right of the, the object rotation visually. And we found not just the so, so surprising congruent movements break through the mask area, but also uh, live coupling. So when you actually move the object in, in front of you, people perceive the object, perceive it is maybe not a good word, just report uh, area than uh, replay condition. And geomagic touch, <laughs> finally I was using. Anyway, uh, there's another experiment we use. This time it's free virtual reality using a kind of 3D stylus pen. This can capture the 3D rotation movement. So basically people, this time not just rotation, but people can rotate the object free form. So any kind of movement is allowed. And this time just compare the live vertical coupling and static one and replay. Again, replay is just uh, coming from the previous session. And this time, it's not just a rotating direction, but actually recognizing the object, the object recognition task. So there could be two different shape of object you, you will see and just left or right to discriminate the object under the mask. So this is a actual uh, experimental scene. And again, we show, we found uh, breakthrough time is uh, first uh, when people interact with actual normal coupling object compared to the replay or static. So, so using replay means the movement, the speed of movement or kind of other property of the movement should be constant. All the movement is their own movement, but just the previous one. So the only difference between a replay and the vertical coupling is whether this is ongoing live coupling or not. And that actually changes the visibility. So the summary for these two experiments is uh, the both experiments show sensory motor coupling of external object affect the, the breakthrough speed of the, under the continuous suppression paradigm. And experiment one inter is interestingly contingency in addition to congruence affect the visual awareness of motion perception. And experiment two showed, again, the uh, contingency, sensory motor contingency modulate the visual awareness. And especially this time, uh, the object recognition also enhanced with the uh, uh, live coupling. And just going to discussion for these two results. And the first one, it's not, I don't really, I still haven't yet interpreted the data, but one interesting thing is, is this contingency actually affect the breakthrough uh, time. And interestingly, there's really old study, but uh, infants, really early stage of development, people actually, baby can detect the live ongoing interaction already. So there's a study by Traversen. She is maybe is a really famous developmental psychologist. Uh, they make interaction between the baby and the mother with the live camera and the display. And they did really similar manipulation what I did. So basically they re record the interaction between the mother and the infant and just replay the mother's emotion with emotional expression to the baby. But baby actually couldn't stop crying when just a replay, even the visual stimuli is the exact same with the live coupling. So it means baby actually notice 
this is not the library couple. So it means it needs like a bidirectional information flow to make a communication happen. So I did not, it didn't actually explain the mechanism why contingency can enhance the formation of this visual awareness, but something really fundamental that uh, noticing the contingency of the interaction. And for the second experiment, I just show some recent interesting studies showed in uh, somatocentric cortex, which basically process the uh, tactile sensation in your brain somewhere here. And that in that part of brain, actually, they they looks like having a visual object categorization is represented. So they they, they successfully decode this object category from the S1. S1 is really low level primary smart sensory cortex. So people don't think they actually have representation of a visual object, but they found only this object you actually knew, like a wine glass or phone, mobile phone, uh, is uh, represent, represented in a smart sensory cortex, but not this uh, unknown abstract object. So which means uh, maybe these familiar object you have you already knew the sensory motor uh, coupling or contingency is also processed in a sensory motor cortices, not just a visual cortex. So that may be one possibility to affect the visual formation of uh, object recognition in a continuous flash separation paradigm. And so far, we just use always kind of in somehow geometric formation. I mean, I try to disturb the sensory motor coupling, but even the uh, deprey or invert inverting the axis is still coupled spatial way. So I just made completely non-geometrical <laughs> coupling. So it's just uh, using the shader to change the surface vector all, all the time, but it's still coupled when only it deform when you move. So it's another type of coupling, but completely not geometrical. So I just want to test this kind of disturbing, this way to disturbing the sensory motor. So with, even with that, the space that you move through is actually a 3D space. It's just a 3D space map to a set of parameters that are not yeah. really additional to the object. What if you take something like, uh, let's say I'm rotating in 2D, normally uh, 2D rotations, if I rotate one way, then rotate another way, I get back to where I started. But in 3D, that's not necessarily the case if I combine two positions. Mm -hmm. So what if you match the what the person expects with something that has a mathematical structure that actually doesn't recur in the way that it should recur given the geometry of the space in which it's displayed? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I don't know, I don't know how you would make a non-associative <laughs> set of yeah. transforms, but that's kind of what you would need to do mm -hmm. for 3D. But if you did in 2D, you could make um, 2D where uh, it's rotating one way, rotating the back, and yeah. it actually takes you back to where you started. Yeah, for example. Or there's another one, um, I think there's a VR demo uh, walking around in a hyperbolic. Yeah, I saw that one, yeah, recently. Yeah, yeah that, you, that might be really interesting. Yeah, yeah because well, if you walk forward yeah. and walk back, you don't actually return to where you mm. started. So, it's completely, yeah, Mr. 3D kind of special perception. I, I think perception. reports of people feel like they're falling off the ground because the distance is <laughs> Any direction you go in the ground always becomes further away yeah. if you transport two points in parallel and it's not hyperbolic at all. So it's like this constant pause, yeah, <laughs> interesting pollock sensation. I like the idea that um, Yeah, I think that for the second part, maybe 
who's talking about there's two different type of synesthesia. Sometimes people see a color actually on the text, but some people actually just association. They see experience color, but somewhere, not the localizing somewhere. So maybe in that case, I think he specifies specif specifically talking about that project. Okay, uh, sorry, the association associate. Okay. So one. Um, when you're driving along, it's like, it's like, okay. I think, yeah, the feeling of presence is many different dimensions. So I think sensory motor feeling is one of that. I don't want to say that the only kind of factor to determine the presence. But and um, what is the first part? Uh, yeah, the mental stuff. Yeah. But um, I think, that, yeah, still, when you mentally imagine some rotation, it's not actual physical movement. So that's why maybe. But yeah, it's kind of still really controversial. I, I agree. So, two hypotheses, right? One is Oh, this doesn't stretch, that's why. Okay. Um, just It seems like there's two hypotheses. One is the strong kind of, it's because of predictive coding hypothesis. And I would say that your example is the counterexample to that. Um, but the other hypothesis is just that the feeling of presence is informed by things that are coming along sensory and motor channels, but maybe not in a way that is correctly uh, understood with the predictive coding hypothesis, right? So it wouldn't be that it's because the motion is more realistic or something like that, but it may be because the um, time scale of occurrence of things in the perceived thing and the time scale of the actual uh, initiation of the action are close enough together, or because there's something where if you look at the hypotheses about what could control it, um, when you initiate something, you have extra information that the environment doesn't have. So when you find things that you could predict using what you know only you have, then that can be a signal of causality. So there's a lot of other kinds of hypotheses that I guess don't get discussed as much that would be uh, still sensory motor things, just not sensory motor things with this particular mechanism. Uh, uh. Maybe it's related to the to the previous question, what what do you think about the uh, contribution of causal ref causal inference to the feeling of presence? Because uh, even in the first coupling three, the forming one, uh, the causality is obvious, right? When you move, things change. So uh, they are coupling still. So so do you think that's the coupling might already make something, but I'm not sure that actually is are making kind of object food or feeling of 3D object, you know, ness by not spatial coupling. So that's another dimension. Like, uh, is it actually necessary for the geometrical spatial rotation, not just a causal relationship, or maybe it's enough to use the uh, of the relationship to make a feel stronger feeling of presence. So maybe, yeah, there, there's actually a lot of, uh, yeah, way to explore more. But thanks. Can I just go into second one? Yeah. I think I'm going back to the, this image, men, mental image stuff after this second one. So this one is a bit different from this sensory motor embodied approach to consciousness. It's more like a visual aspect of, uh, or a visual experience stuff. And recently it's actually started some kind of resurgence for the psychedelic experience. So 
there's several paper and even from uh, our laboratory published uh, the paper uh, analyzing the brain data under the psilocybin and LSD and ketamine to show the higher complexity in the brain state in that kind of state. And uh, this alter state of consciousness or psychedelic state of consciousness has been used to study phenomenological as conscious and phenomenological aspect of consciousness. So it actually changed your consciousness totally different way, not, not just a sleep, not just a wake, but the alternative state of consciousness. But uh, these, the people said uh, it's different alter, alternated conscious state or conscious mode. But this, this phenomenology is always contaminated by other the other symptom, other change of your consciousness. For example, this is a questionnaire people use for after giving them a LSD. Like a, maybe you cannot see that, but something like I saw a pattern or color, or I see things look strange, or sense of size of spaces, or these are all, all related to the visual distortion of experiment. Experience. But one is that is a, my feeling of time is distorted. So this is kind of temporal distortion, distortion of experience. And these, these kind of different type of distortions always happen when you have a altered state. So for example, visual hallucination and time distortion is normally comes together. Is that also fake that graph or where only other people can find it? Sorry, say it. Uh, so it's actually some university in London, uh, Imperial College people have some right to give the drug to the... Right, I don't... <laughs> so uh, the author of the paper, uh, mm -hmm. other people, yeah. they get the drug. So my question is, if the author of that paper was the same person who took the drugs? No, uh, they, uh, they give the drug to participants. And yeah, ask the question after that. It's not uh, the author's report. <laughs> we cannot say that, <laughs> maybe. But yeah, these are the, 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 the how to say, visual hallucination, time distortion always happen, like not just a drug, but. Same? Like a feeling of time is a bit weird. Really, feeling really slow, or feeling so fast, or sometimes feel a moment as an infinite, or those kind of temporal distortions. And not just a drug administrated uh, psychedelic state, but also Parkinson, Parkinson disease or schizophrenic patient report both hallucination, visual hallucination and time distortion. So it's kind of difficult to dissociate to, to the different type of symptom each other. So one way is maybe simulating one certain aspect of the psychedelic state with virtual reality, maybe some contribution to dissociated problems. So the idea is quite simple. We just combine, uh, I don't know, maybe most people already knew that two years ago, Google uh, announced their new visualization method to, to deep convolution network to make uh, any arbitrary image into like hallucinatory trippy image. And it just made, combine these two and make a virtual reality version of deep dream. So I don't know, maybe more if, if people here know deep neural network a lot. So I try to make quick summary for these kind of stuff and go into actual video of the hallucination machine. So, so basically machine learning is defined. So there's data and some function is going to some class, class level 
that that's all. The always data to level. And we call this is, for example, if the data is an image, we call it object recognition task. So this image, whether the machine learning can de determine whether this image contains dog or cat or, or whatever category. And people use a neural network for a long time, but it used to be it's really shallow, just two or three layer or maybe five, but uh, something that kind of layers. But quite recently, maybe thanks to the development of uh, GP, GPU, they, people can run, can make really highly layer stack the neural network, which is called deep neural network. And deep learning is basically machine learning methods that attempt to model the obstruction in the data by using multiple highly layered network. And I think what, what yeah, this slide is actually made a few years ago, so I don't know if this is still true or not, but one thing people are really excited about that is automatic hier hier hierarchical future extraction. So it used to be machine learning people first extract futures by hand, my, my, by human hand, and then use like a SVN or to make a separation. But deep neural network looks like automatically extract these futures, like a lower layer it's processor, like the edge or line and a higher layer part of the object and going to more highly category. And 2012, there is a huge performance gap from the classic object recognition. So this is a machine vision kind of contest. The people try to do, uh, the, try machine to recognize object from the bunch of images. And in 2002, this Google Net actually performed really well to compare to the classic method. And actually, in 2015, it's outperformed the human rec object recognition. And so basically, the deep neural network is functionally uh, equivalent, equivalent to the human visual, at least object recognition task. And it's more interestingly, people start thinking this deep neural network, especially deep convolutional network for visual recognition task, could be a model of a visual, bi biological visual system like a human vision. And there's some study that showing compare the what deep neural network run and what actual human visual system does. So they use uh dissimilar dissimilarity matrices analysis for deep neural network and actual human brain data using fmri and they showed uh so the x-axis for this graph is uh, uh so this the, this upper graph is a human in, inferior temporal cortex which basically saw to process kind of object recognition. So when you see, when you identify object, visual object, this part of the brain is activated more. And this part of the brain is more similar to the higher layer. So the, this x-axis is a layer of the deep convolutional network. The higher layer of the deep neural network, deep artificial neural network is more correlated or more similar to the uh, IT area of the brain, but it's, when you see the early visual cortex, like V1, V2, it's more similar to the lower lower layer of the deep neural network. So structurally also, it's interesting because deep neural network is not designed to mimic the actual human visual system, but somehow it looks really similar between these two structures. And Deep neural network is really complicated. So people want to visualize what they actually do. So it's a lot of different methods to visualize what each layer feature in different ways. So for example, this is one between deep neural network and uh, they visualize lower layer, what lower layer process, the, what kind of feature they process in this layer, like this or uh, lower layer process like a line line wish 
structure, but if, if you go in up the network, uh, what they represent is much more complex and object-wise. And this one is, a, I think, one last year. This one is maybe coming after the deep dream one and combined with the generic GAN method to make really clear image of the deep, uh, deep neural network, which is actually amazing. It looks like really realistic, but anyway. I didn't actually use this method for my deep dream, but I, I won't touch it. And now I have a version of that that does 4096 by 4096. Okay. <laughs> I see, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I need to use them. And deep dream is similar to this visualization technique, but just use natural image as an input. So it actually turn arbitrary image with this visualization method. So in running process, deep neural network normally use back propagation, error back pro propagation method. But in the deep, to, to change the, to train the neural network weight between the neuron. But in deep dream, they just fix this weight and instead they actually change the input image itself. And consequently, it's something like this. So this is my office, but it gradually changes into the deep dream version. So at the end, lots of animal and bugs everywhere. So the idea is, so deep neural network, original idea is, as I said, recognizing image, or content of image to the level. But deep dream is basically other way around, from category to image. And I just briefly mentioned about some virtual reality stuff I remade. Uh, this one is actually working with uh, Sohe when, when I was still in Japan. So we made a uh, kind of alternative version of virtual reality called substitutional reality. And the basic idea, instead of using computer generated contents in virtual reality, we actually use panoramic recording to capture 360 degree panoramic video and show people with head mounted display. So, and the idea is we also have a camera on the participant face and we can switch between the live feed from face and one pre-recorded but 360 rec degree record uh, video. So the idea is even people uh, in uh, watching the pre-recorded video because you can still move in the 360 video. You cannot tell whether you are in the right situation or pre-recorded. So maybe it's better to show the video. So again, this is the lab in Sussex, um, starting from live, but now it's already pre-recorded. So it's a bit weird, I'm watching myself. So just kind of, so this time the left side is uh, live and right side they are pre-recorded. Basically, it's really undistinguishable. And I didn't actually use this live replay switching stuff, but just use panoramic video recording to make people experience really highly realistic experience. And using that deep dream stuff, I just made, this is just sample stuff, but the Sussex campus street, but now it's basically full of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and people keep asking why there's so many dogs. And it looks like there, I just use uh, the Google, Google's, yeah. And they, they, there's uh, so many, I think 20, more than 20 category within dog. So maybe that's the reason. But also maybe dog faces, so easy to detect, like maybe three dogs with maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> my, my understanding is that it's like more similar two things are, the more detailed the network. Yeah, that, that's my, boundary, that's. So it's just why dogs. Mm. 
Okay, so it's just some detail just made. So the original Deep Dream algorithm is for static image. So to process the video, it needs to be taking account of the frame by frame uh, some inference. So there's actually one algorithm, but I, it also didn't really work well. So I just modified something. And I already made a, a GitHub page for this algorithm. So if someone wants to make own Deep Dream video, you can just use this. But it takes really long time because it's a 4K video. So three minutes deep three video takes one week with my pretty really high GPU computer. I don't know, maybe I can speed up now maybe with much faster computer. It's already eight, but just quickly evaluate the system. So this one is just a, a testing the, how this deep dream hallucination machine is similar to the actual psychedelic experience. So we just use the same questionnaire people use already with the actual drug administration. It's called just as altered state of consciousness questionnaire. And we also compare, so the, basically we just compare the hallucination machine with control original video it's within study comparison, but we also compare the data from us and uh, psilocybin data that people subject to report after taking psilocybin. And left one is a, blue one is a deep dream and a gray one is control video. So apparently there's a, it's not actually surprising. The, the question is about like when you did you see a pattern or you know, color? Of course they saw because we presented. So it's not so surprising, but at least simi some similarity between, uh, and sorry, it didn't say that, but this orange is actual questionnaire data from drug, ad the drug ad administration and blue one is our data. So some similarity between these two experiences using virtual reality simulated hallucination and actual psychedelic hallucination. And so the original uh, motivation for making this hallucination machine is not just for fun. So I didn't want to make this more scientifically. And we just compare the temporal, pers temporal uh, perception in the deep dream experiment experience. So as I said, some people change their temporal distortion when you take a drug. But we couldn't, let me say some, yeah, we couldn't normally dissociate with it, which cause which, like uh, time, time actually, temporal perception is distorted, just expecting some un unusual event, like uh, something happening uh, suddenly. It, uh, it already changed your perception. So maybe time, temporal distortion under psychedelic state is just stay watching really bizarre visual scene. It's not, not directly induced by the drug itself. So we just test temporal perception under the deep dream hallucination machine. And we, we use just temporal production tasks, temporal interval production production tasks. So before hand, people are a little bit trained to generate one second, two second, four second. And uh, in actual hallucination machine, they are instructed to make a same stuff. And we didn't find anything. So basically, time distortion wasn't induced by visual hallucination itself, but more more fundamental drug, actual drug can maybe change their time perception. And we also, uh, after the each block, we also asked some subjective experience, and we only found uh, people feel felt less presence, um, sorry, less attentive in the deep dream which doesn't <laughs> give many, much information, but that, that's what we found in the deep dream. So yeah, summary, we made a hallucination machine combining with virtual, combining virtual reality with the deep dream algorithm. And experiment one at least 
shows some similarity between the hallucination machine induced visual experience and drug induced experience. And experiment two shows temporal distortion is not the so experience hallucination machine is not sufficient to induce temporal distortion. And maybe temporal distortion reported in pharmacological induced altered state is not the same. Uh, it's not by the visual hallucination induced, but more general systemic effect of psychedelic compound. And just going to discussion. So one interesting, so there's some actually already some virtual reality study try to simulate visual hallucination. But one advantage of our approach is we can parameterizing the many different type of visual hallucination with the emphasizing different layer of deep neural network. And interestingly, there's a, at least two different type of visual hallucination reported in actual human subject, like a, the thing, uh, the, the ordinary psychedelic experience is more like this geometric hallucination. Like people see a lot of edge on something on the, the world. But some other hallucination called, this one is called Charles Bonnet syndrome. It's often happened after optical eye disease. So they sometimes they're losing their sight and out, their sight, not perfectly, but some certain area of their sight is losing. And after that, they start seeing really complex things. And they know this is a hallucination, but sometimes they actually see person standing in front of you, but all hallucination. So there's two different type of hallucination, like simple shape like hallucination to more complex full fledge content. So maybe this different type of hallucination is just a matter of the different ray of visual system. And it's just a, another example for, this one is uh, emphasizing a little bit lower layer of the network. Then it's make, I don't know how to describe but the, all, the edges are more, more emphasized. And some people said this is more similar to the LSD, but I don't know. <laughs> no. And yeah, this one is I already showed, but this one is more full fledged hallucination, like uh, object is actually there. And I just discuss a bit more uh, conceptual computational similarity between actual hallucination, visual hallucination, and a deep, deep neural network. And we all, I already show, said that uh, it's already human rebel performance in object recognition. So functionally, deep neural network is much close to human visual system. And also, the representation of the visual system and the deep neural network is quite similar. So maybe deep neural network I use is already somehow, I'll say, convincing to model or simulate a human visual system. And more interestingly, uh, deep dream algorithm we I use is somehow maybe mimic the actual process in the brain to when we see a hallucination. Because uh, the deep neural network use back propagation and already some people say back propagation is equivalent to a predict coding model with some constraint. So it's basically some people say deep convolutional network is purely feed forward. So it's not the actual human brain. Feed, human brain, human visual system is more recurrent or it's much, how to say, much more loop happening. And deep neural network, especially deep convolutional network here I use is three feed forward. But actually back propagation is something like a top down effect and maybe the way to process this hallucinatory pattern is somehow similar to the actual brain process. And, and maybe uh, the, the things I like is visual hallucination could be somehow similar mechanism with active inference. So active inference is the tab from the predict, uh, sorry, free energy principle. And it basically actively making some inference to change your sensory input. And this hallucination, visual hallucination, is maybe one extreme case of active inference, not just changing your internal state, but 
it's actually changing the peripheral sensory input to minimize the prediction error. So sometimes people confuse between hallucination and delusion, but maybe delusion and hallucination is completely opposite in terms of delusion is changing your higher categorical level, but hallucination is actually changing the sensory input distance. And this is actually final slide. Uh, I just want to discuss it's a little bit the relevant to what Ryota recently proposed, a gen gener generative process may be the foundation of consciousness. I, I was actually thinking really similar stuff. So this is just schematic graph. What visual hallucination and simple and complex hallucination mean? So normal hallucination, normal perception. Maybe we have a both feed forward, feed back loop, uh, feed back process is kind of balanced. But when people see complex hallucination, Maybe we have uh, attenuated feed forward bottom up signal and much stronger top down signal. But this is actually across all the hierarchy. So from the really top top level categorical layer of visual system to the really lower early visual system, or uh, recruiting all layer to generate complex pattern. So that's why people see really uh, clear details of natural image. And it is really contrasting for with the uh, mental imagery. So when you, it, I, I am really impressed complex hallucination because this is also made by your frame, but really highly detailed. We cannot distinguish from the real object. And this is totally different from when you just imagine something in your mind. And maybe imagination is just a recruiting High, high array of the network. That's why it's always broad and lacking of detail. Some people actually imagine something much detail. So I don't know, maybe that's actually true. But maybe it's something like this. And psychedelic experience or more geometric hallucination is maybe involved only the lower array of network, not, 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 not recruiting the higher array of visual network. That's why they always con constrain like, uh, emphasizing age or lower future of the visual structure is more abundant in the experience. And, oh, sorry, it is another slide just from me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a bit out of the deep, deep sorry, uh, hallucination machine, but I think this is really common view for the, the hallucination and the conscious experience. And this, as a, as a whole, we, our approach is to try to make uh, uh, the simulator using virtual reality and uh, artificial intelligence. And this is maybe a new way to study a atypical altered conscious phenomenology in empirical way by directly compare uh, people after taking drugs and people after experience this kind of virtual simulator. So we see we may have some access to the, the people who can actually administrate the drug. So and finally I I'm my original place is actually coming from uh, my original area of study is artificial life. So always I want to make something to understand. So I want to always go into this direction, understanding consciousness by consciousness by synthesizing it, creating it. But the AI approach what Ryota is taking for the moment is always difficult to evaluate how to de decide whether AI has conscious or not. So it, maybe you said using IIT to evaluate. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, maybe it's not, uh, you cannot convince everyone. So it's always difficult sometimes to convince, to choose one theory to, yeah, this is always going to be that consciousness. But maybe virtual reality approach is some kind of alternative because we can maybe show actual experience made by AI. So the, the deep dream is just a first step, but uh, something like that approach would be way to target uh, machine consciousness with actual subject, as a subject, as an actual subjective experience for people is maybe 
some new study. So maybe, of course, m much direct way is using machine, human machine inter in brain, sorry, much human brain computer interface, like uh, Elon Musk recently announced they will make a neural link to actually embedded the machine in your brain. But maybe with that, you can actually replace all the visual cortex with deep computational network and how people actually change the consciousness or something drastic way to test that kind of thing. Thank you. Do you know about sleep paralysis? You didn't talk about it at all, but I think it's maybe related to, to your work because in that case, people wake up, but they cannot move and it start getting hallucination, but they cannot tell the difference between reality and the dream. So I don't know, what do you think about that? I think sleep paralysis, paralysis is a type of dream still, like a type similar to the lucid dream, I guess. I don't know. But when you dream, you know it's different. Yeah, but that's a, maybe the difference in the metacognition of your experience. But I don't know how much it's actually different. I mean, I think that's a really high level hallucination, maybe. Even it's replaced all of your world surrounding you. Not no, it's no, no. No? Part of the world is normal, and then you have hallucination, hallucination. But if you're lying down, you know, you're lying down, but you're either walking. Okay. I heard sometimes people actually walk around. I don't think so. Yeah. Sleep paralysis, you cannot move. Sometimes they actually experience walking down. So I, my my. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes when you have sleep paralysis, and if you really try to move, then you sometimes have out of body experience. I think that's the original definition of the out of body experience. Yeah, it's a really interesting. Yeah, I had a serious paralysis last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then I asked for help, but not this time. My daughter could hear me. <laughs> but I think, yeah, that sleep paralysis is maybe extreme version of hallucination, so it's quite interesting. Is that because uh, you are not directly approaching the dream problem right, right now? Because it's a highly complex hallucination type, so you're you're attacking from a lower uh, hallucination type. Is that is that is that correct? Uh, you mean? I mean, I, you just. Oh, I was interested whether you're going to attack the dream problem, uh, because you mentioned about the mental imagery, yeah. but uh, you didn't mention about dream imagery, which I think is different. Because when you're actively awake and if you imagine things, I think it's, as you said, it's blurry and it's you know yeah. very temporal. But uh, when you dream and when you can, um, when you, I don't know how exactly to call it, but if you have a dream skill, if you have a high dream skill, you can you know you can you can have a lucid dreaming and you can also record it. And I used to record all my dreams for like a year, and I I can. Remember quite well what well, I was saying. This vividness of right. dream. Yeah. I, some I, some I, people I, said that after so. recording so. makes your dream more vivid or realistic. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, of course, the dream is really interesting. But uh, I feel the dream is another alter, alter, alter state of consciousness. It's not compar comparative with awakening consciousness, people said. So. Maybe, of course, that's really interesting. So at the very beginning of your talk, you showed examples of how you can get someone to feel like they possess a body that they're actually seeing in front of them. And I'm curious, if you want to actually experience the consciousness of an AI or something like that, it seems like a very easy experiment to try would be that you use the same hallucination, um, but you actually allow something other than the person to control some percentage of the motions of the body that you're trying to get them to associate with themselves, and then see how much extra feed you can put in before it breaks the illusion. Do you know if anyone has done something to put possession of something that the person 
that that's basically being controlled by someone else. I mm, I couldn't actually remember anything right now, but yeah, maybe something. Yeah. Easy to do, right? Well, I'm I'm curious about the. Um, actual feeling like that is me as opposed to the feeling like I'm somehow controlling that because I think if you put control sorry I think if you put control in the hands of someone else you'll very quickly break the illusion that I'm controlling that but if the that is me illusion can be preserved while the I'm controlling that illusion can be broken I mean there are clinical disorders that have that kind of where people have that experience right like this isn't my hand but it's still attached to me or there's the same group. I don't know. It's the same. The what you actually want for? They use robotic arm to stroke your back. So you actually stroke your back by your own movement. Well, interesting thing is they found when this movement is asynchronously touching your back, people start feeling someone is behind. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So it's kind of attribute your agency to someone. That's, and that happened. That 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 didn't happen when it's synchronous. So maybe that in that case, the temporal delay makes you dissociate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 